Welcome to tonight's In Conversation program. My name is Christy McMillan and I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement here at the Asheville Art Museum. We've all made a lot of changes over the past year. As most of you know, the museum has shifted much of our programming to the virtual realm. While we've missed engaging with you in the galleries, one silver lining that has come from this time apart has been the opportunity to bring the museum to folks near and far from Asheville, Western North Carolina, across the state, country, and around the world, and to feature special guests that we might not have been able to in pre-COVID times. This chance opens up our ability to richly interpret the artwork in our collection and special exhibitions through a range of voices and points of view. We have a number of evening and conversation programs coming up that I'll mention to you at the end of the program. This evening, we're thrilled to welcome Ben Shapiro. Ben directed the film Brief Encounters, which tells the story of photographer Gregory Crudson, whose work is currently on view in our special exhibition, Vantage Points, Contemporary Photography from the Whitney Museum of American Art. This exhibition has been a source of delight for in-person visitors and a fertile ground for conversation and virtual programming for participants of all ages. If you haven't yet seen it, the exhibition is closing soon on March 15th. You won't want to miss the opportunity to see Crudson and other great photographers of the past 50 years work from the Whitney. As we mentioned on our website and in the confirmation email, there are several ways for you to watch Ben's film, including streaming at home or on the big screen at the Grail Movie House's new location in the River Arts District. The film is phenomenal, so if you don't, didn't get a chance to screen it before this evening's program, please give yourself the gift of watching it after the program. Even though I thought I knew a lot about Crudson's work before, I learned so much from Ben's film. For this evening's program, our assistant curator, Hilary Schroeder, will start us off with a brief overview of Gre Gregory Crudson's work, in case anyone didn't get a chance to screen the film beforehand. Hillary and I will then engage Ben in conversation about his interest in Gregory Crudson and his experience making the film. During the program, please add any questions or comments that you have to the chat box. We'll leave time at the end of the evening for Q&A. Now, please join me in welcoming Hillary Schroeder, the museum's assistant curator, who will be moderating the program with me this evening. Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, and let me get some visuals up for everyone here. Um, so I wanna reiterate what Christy said that um, this film that Ben has made is just a wonderful insight into an artist whose work is quite grand in scale and exquisite in detail. And I think as a curator, I often want to know these bits of magic that go into making something happen. And this film really gives you an incredible insight and understanding um, and just a delightful portrait of the person making this work. And I think to many degrees as well, the community that it takes to produce um, these really exquisite photos. So just to give you a quick overview before we dive into some of the film elements and talk about some clips and whatnot, just to give a quick overview of Gregory Crudson. He was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1962, where he was raised on the Park Slope in the Park Slope neighborhood of Brooklyn. Um, his father was a psychoanalyst, which had a lot of influence on his work. He actually thought to maybe go into psychology himself and realized that maybe wasn't his particular path and eventually found his way into making photography. Um, his father did work out of the family home though, so he was exposed to it regularly as a kid. His family vacationed in Massachusetts and Massachusetts is probably the most prominent and frequent site for many of his bodies of work, although he has worked outside of Massachusetts, but um, the film that we are discussing tonight really follows one of his sort of most ambitious series that was made in Lee, Massachusetts. He received his bachelor's from SUNY Purchase and an MFA from Yale, and he is currently a professor and the director of graduate studies in photography at Yale University. And he's known for these just truly beautifully detailed and carefully com composed large-scale photographs. If you joined us in time to hear the music, 
um, that led into our program tonight. That is a song called Let Me Take Your Picture by the band The Speedies. That was their underground hit. And Crudson was a member of the band back in the day. And it was a bit of a prophetic um, song for them to have as a hit. So um, he works primarily in series and i'm going to just take you through a couple of photographs from some of his major series um, they often span quite a long period of time that he works on sort of a single project and i think you'll find as you look at his work if you've seen it in person or just in passing although i encourage you to come to the museum and see it in person because it is just an experience that can't be really duplicated in, in a digital format, but um, the, the works feel sometimes distant or a little bit uncanny, um, and other times they move into something that is truly fantastic that I think is um, part of what makes his work continually engaging. So let me just take you through a couple of images here. Oh, I wanted to note that one thing that Ben highlights really wonderfully in the film is how an exhibition of Dean Arbus's work that Crutzen saw as a young person had a huge influence on him. And so you can see here a work from our collection, The King and Queen of a Senior Citizen Dance, New York City, 1970. Um, just to give you a little context of one of those very influential photographers that Crutzen was looking to as he sort of grew into his own. Um, he notes in the film that his own work is a little bit different from hers. And yeah, I think you can see how he's referencing her work. Um, he also is very interested in film and there are often elements of Al Alfred Hitchcock in his work, as well as David Lynch, and in particular, Blue Velvet is a huge influence, um, particularly on this early series, Natural Wonder. Uh, and a lot of times there are references to Edward Hopper that can be found, which I think makes a lot of sense because Edward Hopper was working in upstate New York and in a very similar environment to the one that um, that Crutzen was, is working in in uh, Massachusetts. So not every work he makes is big and cinematic. This is a more intimately scaled work from the mid 90s, but what he's really well known for are these large scale, highly detailed works that are shot either on location or on a set. He's really interested in creating a world and capturing a specific moment wherein he's able to explore his own anxieties and fears. Um, this is the work that's currently on view at the Asheville Art Museum that you can come see in person. And um, every single element of his photographs are intentional, considered, um, no detail goes unnoticed. Um, and so I think as you are able to look into these tiny little details of the photographs, that becomes very clear. Um, this work is from Beneath the Roses, which is the series that is featured in Brief Encounter. And um, it's just one of quite a few works. And I, I mean, it's just magical to watch how these photographs come together and uh, behind the scenes, uh, fully movie set style with like set dressers and everything. Although not actors, he often works with people from the community, normal everyday people. And um, they're just, they're, they're almost, they're using light as opposed to like, there's no flash photography in these works. There's kind of installed almost again, like a movie lights. Um, and then just to take us through a couple more series to see the progression, this is um, the follow-up to the work that is featured in the film. So something a little quieter, but I like that this connects to an actual movie set in Rome. So he's actually taking his own interest to a place where movies were made at one point in time. And so you can see he kind of comes back to similar elements over the course of his career, although there are different ideas that he's exploring within each body of work. So he'll, he'll take something and work with it for a long period of time and then sort of let it go. And then this is from his most recent body of work called An Eclipse of Moths, um, which he was working on um, in 2018 and sort of returned to a very, very large scale at 60 by almost 95 inches. So, um, and you'll note that as I've gone through these images, there's often maybe one or two figures. So there's this sense of sort of expansiveness that the space in which he is making the picture is a character as much as the figures within it. 
So anyways, that's kind of a quick overview of Crudson, but I think that if we get into some of these clips and conversation, conversation with Ben, we're going to be able to get into some really rich content and have a understanding of these photographs that I think by the end we're all going to feel ready to come in and see the one we have here in person and then try to find every single one we can out in the wild to enjoy and appreciate. So I'm going to pass it back to Christy to take us on to the next thing. Thank you, Hillary. I appreciate that. It's nice to sort of zip through. I, I love looking at these photos. And and now that I've seen Ben's film, I can sort of pick out exactly how they were put together. So that was one of the great things about watching it. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce our special guest, Ben Shapiro. Ben Shapiro is a New York-based documentary director, cinematographer, and radio producer. His work has appeared theatrically and at major festivals internationally, at museums, including New York's Museum of Modern Art, as well as broadcast on CBS, CBC, HBO, and National Geographic. His projects have received awards, including Peabody, DuPont, Emmy, and American Film Institute's first prize. He's also a contributor to NPR programs and to Radio Diaries. By the way, Ben, I listen to Radio Diaries like every week, so it was really neat to know that you were associated with that. His current project, which I will ask you about um, towards the end of the program, is a feature-length documentary about renowned drummer, composer, and activist Max Roach, and it will appear later this year. Please welcome, or please join me in welcoming Ben Shapiro. Thanks, Christy, and again, welcome, Ben. We're thrilled to have you Thank here you. with us tonight. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thanks for thanks for asking me. So I think we're going to kick things off by showing the trailer for the film, um, just to kind of set the stage and introduce it. Making a feature is 24 frames a second. Making a Gregor Kruse photograph is one frame a second, and it's more powerful than most features I've seen. Try sitting right more on the curb a little bit. The car could actually go back like another foot. Just move the phone a couple inches towards him. Maybe too much. Like that. My pictures are about a search for a moment, a perfect moment. Look how beautiful that is. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Something always necessarily goes wrong. Can we have quiet, please? I don't think there was ever a time where I didn't wake up absolutely feeling sick to my stomach. Position and hold. Gregory takes great pains to create these yeah. fantastical worlds that are seamlessly real. There has always been while I was making the photographs, this sort of blurring of reality and fiction. Using actual places. That's the abyss right there. Actual inhabitants of the towns. Hey, it's Gregory. To try to draw out something psychological. Oh, that's amazing. Her expression's incredible. Look at that sky. That's the best sky we've ever had. To me, the most beautiful moment in the whole process is when everything comes together and for that instance, my life makes sense. So Ben, talk to us uh, a little bit about your first exposure uh, to Crudson and what made you want to make a film about him? Sorry, you're muted, Ben. There you go. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, well, yeah. The film, the film goes back a ways. I mean, you know, like it was shot over this ten-year period, basically, and in the two thousands. And um, I had known before that I'd seen his photographs, some of his photographs before that. And I, and I was working for um, a public television station in New York, um, making uh, short films to them about artists, and they assigned me the task of making a short film about Gregory. So I came up to Western Massachusetts where he was shooting uh, and I spent a few days filming with him and made this piece for 
for PBS. And after I did that, I just, I, while I was doing that, um, I was struck by the process. I mean, it was, it was um, interesting to just see it firsthand. And I was also struck by how um, visual the process was. Um, and, you know, I, the way I work is, I mean, still, I mean, I usually work as kind of a one man band where I'm just, it's just me and my camera. I shoot also, I'm a cinematographer, so I shoot. And um, so I decided what I wanted to do after making that one piece was I just was curious. I just wanted to try um, to keep on filming Gregory is, is his process without really having an idea of how it would all end up. And he was amenable to that. And so I, you know, sort of informally at first kind of joined the crew. Um, and, you know, when he takes his photographs, um, and the productions are large scale. And so the crews are, you know, they're 30, 40 people. And so um, I kind of just became another person on the set, basically. And, and they, would, they would invite me to, you know, come and, you know, let me know when the shoots were happening. And, and I did that for a number of years. Um, and that, that's, that's how it kind of came to, came to be. So as a filmmaker, do you feel a, a kinship with a still photographer for who the mise-en-scene or the cinematic composition of every element and image is integral to the work? Um, yeah, yes and no. I mean, because I'm, I'm, I'm a documentary maker. And so I deal with the, generally speaking, I deal with the world as it is. I mean, I, I'll light interviews and things, but I, I don't, you know, I don't do the, what he does in terms of, you know, crafting in the same way. But I do share a, a fascination for, you know, um, in my own work for, um, I mean, as a documentary filmmaker, you have to always have to be thinking about what's interesting and what's happening and what are the elements that are, that will be meaningful in a film. And so I, I have that kind of interest also. I mean, his process is certainly interesting to me in that way. I mean, the other thing that I was, but the thing that was also interesting to me about his work as a filmmaker was, um, you know, when you go onto the sets or when you want, when he's making his photographs, he's, you know, he's, he's, I mean, some of them are shot on, on sound stages and sets, but the ones that are outside, you know, they're real, they're real things. They're really happening. I mean, the light he's making and the fact that he, like that one big shot that we saw before with the car in the center of the intersection. Like if you look back in the street, how it gets kind of foggy, it's like they had smoke machines and they were smoking up that set for blocks and they had lights on cranes that were out of this, you know. So the, it's a real space that's happening, even though he's taking a, vis a single photograph. And so for me, shooting as a filmmaker, you know, it's a, there's a real three-dimensional environment that, that's there that, that was interesting to me and vis very visual. I kind of became a fan of the fog guys over the course of the film. Uh -huh. Like every time they popped up, I was just really fascinated by them. Um, so I, I kind of appreciated your attention to his his crew, right? Um, people like to think of artists working all by themselves in like hermit-like solitude, but um, you know these things would never ever happen without such an amazing amount of people to make this moment in time occur. Yeah, I mean, I do. Have, yeah, I mean, that stuff is just interesting to me. You know, I'm a kind of a movie nerd, I guess. So and so, like that process is very. I mean, those are those are movie, those are movie crews, right? Those people who work on his crews are actually, you know, people who the rest of the time they're shooting f features. That's that's what they do. This yeah. is unusual for them. We we actually had a question about that, so I'm just going to skip down to it. Um, that his work is unique and that his photographs really toe the line between documentary photography, if you will, you know, documenting a moment in time, but also cinema. You know, they they are cinematic. They are every every element, as Hillary said, is very carefully um, staged and considered. You know, he's looking at everything that's in the in the picture. But I really found it interesting that you not only interviewed him, you know, rightly so, and and had you know long expanses talking, you know, of him talking about his process, but you also incorporated the voices of his crew, like his director of photography and his set designers and writers that he works with to sort of conceptualize what that scene is about. 
post-production and editors. And I'm wondering, um, you know, that these are roles that are more commonly associated with filmmaking, as you said. So what did you learn from incorporating those voices um, into the documentary? Um, what I learned in terms of his process or just, uh, just I, his like, process or thing. what did you learn yeah. from sort of well, that approach to uh, image making? Well, I mean, yeah, it's very clear. It was very clear that it's, it's very, it's a collaborative process. Right. Um, and I guess, again, that goes back to my own interests in, you know, how films are made, how process, how things are made that way. Um, but, you know, I felt, I guess I felt like the only way to really follow him through his work and his process of making the photographs is the, is his engagement with all these different people, right? And in, in that way, he is very much like a film director, you know, because he's re he's relying on all these people, and it's his kind of relationships and communication with them that 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 makes the work. And so, in, in order to follow his process, you have to kind of go down that you have to go down all those roads, you know, basically. I mean, that's just kind of the only because that's how it, that's how this stuff gets made. I mean, as you, as you see in the film, it's like you know, the film is made at every, in little, in the way that films are, feature films, you know, every little step along the process, you know, things get changed and he exerts his vision and influence. And then this photograph comes out at the end, but you can't isolate any of those different parts of the process, you know, the planning, the day of the shoot, you know, the post-production, you know, it's all, it's all of a thing. Um, so, at the beginning of the film, Gregory Crudson makes a statement about how making a work of art is an act of faith. Mm -hmm. And you yourself are a maker um, of many different things, you know, but um, do you find yourself agreeing with with some of his views on that leap yeah. that's necessary? No, I totally, yeah, no, I totally knows what he, I know what he means. Because every time you start something, you, you don't know how it's going to end up, right? And you invest, you have to invest all this energy and time and resources to, to, to get to that point. And so, yeah, it is an act of faith in a certain way. Every time you try to start doing something, you know, but I mean, it's not so different than like, you know, I mean, cooking a meal, you know, it's like, you know, you don't, there's no guarantee it's going to go well necessarily. Right. And, and, but you kind of do it hoping that, that it does. And you have, and that's the only way to start anything like this creative, a creative project. Yeah, I think that one thing that was kind of heartbreaking for me, this moment in the film is when he says, you know, sometimes despite all of the planning, despite all of the folks there to sort of make this beautiful, perfect moment, just some photographs don't work. Well, and yeah. you think about, you know, somebody throwing a pot or making something in glass that just takes hours and hours and days to prepare and then cracks during the process or something and you know to me that was a really interesting statement about um sort of investing all of that time and then sometimes it just doesn't work out which you know we might not think that that would be possible with all of those folks involved in making it right but you know sometimes just the vision might not translate that I, that's true of any art form yeah i mean that you bring up an interesting point which and i which is the movie doesn't really kind of make clear but I mean, I, I went through a certain, I, I was debating this at a certain point in the movie because I filmed shoots that the photographs didn't work. Like he does do like a, he'll like shoot, he'll do, you know, he'll do like five or 10 pictures. And out of those, you know, two or some more will just, they won't, a certain percentage of them just don't, don't, he, he feels like they didn't, it was, it, it wasn't a success. You know, he'll look at the images later and just kind of, and he'll abandon them before he goes into post-production. And so, and I, and I filmed some of those, you know, I filmed some of those. And so I had this question of whether to like include those in the movie and ultimately I decided not to, but, but, you know, part of the result of that choice is that you don't get to see that, that, that he does do a lot of, that he does do photographs that just, he, he just kind of goes, ah, that was, that was, a, wasn't such a good idea. So we're just not going to like, after they, after they do the whole production, do the shoots, he'll look at like the proof sheets of all these things or now not proof sheets, but you know, he'll. Well, just him mentioning, mentioning it broke my heart enough. So, yeah. <laughs> um, I do uh, want to watch a couple of short clips from the film um, that you had uh, 
provided for us. The first one uh, is about creating the photograph called Hatch. While I get that ready, Ben, can you set that uh, clip up? Yeah, for us? this is this was a photograph that he did. He did some photographs on a soundstage at Mass Mocha. They have actually a, a soundstage that they people use to shoot movies, and they were there were these large scale sets, and this was this was one of them. And so this clip is kind of a condensed, tells a condensed version of making of this photograph. So this is the final drawing of one of the pictures that we made on the soundstage. This was the original um, description that Kazi and I put together. We are looking from a living room into an ordinary suburban kitchen. It appears aged and somewhat neglected. Facing the sink and counter, we see through the murky window out into a backyard. Beyond the fence, light can be seen in neighboring houses. The room is dimly lit. A fluorescent light buzzes above the dirty counter, revealing peeling paint and worn fixtures. Some of the cabinets are ajar, showing a few sparse tins and containers. Unwashed dishes remain in the sink and leftover coffee is long cold. A soft light can be discerned shining from a stairway leading off from the right. Traces of muddy footprints lead out through the kitchen door into the sodding yard. It has been raining and the night air is cold and damp. Through the open door, we see a middle-aged man. He's staring down pensively into an open hatch his face softly illuminated by the glow from underneath. Beneath him stands an old shed lit from within. So what Gregory Crutzen is reading there. I had mentioned that part of the folks uh, that he works with these really large crews for creating the photographs is a writer. And so that um, short piece of writing, I think it was only maybe about a half of a page or three quarters of a page, but it was sort of the vision for the photograph distilled. Why did you choose this as one of the clips for us to watch tonight? Um, because I had it. <laughs> <laughs> I had, a, I had a limited number of clips that I have like prepared. I mean, you know, but, but the, you know, the, the reason why I pulled it as a clip originally was because it just, you know, um, I mean, the film goes through the production of these photographs and, and in the film, you know, you see them as kind of longer process and they take, you know, they take, they watch for like 10 minutes. And that's the one case in the film where you see him do it in this very kind of condensed way. And so that, that was why I originally picked it as a clip to, to have to show um, because of that. It kind of gets you through the whole thing. You kind of, it's an example in, in, you know, buzzing through in like two minutes or something of how he does it from beginning to end, basically. We talk a lot uh, in our collection. So our museum uh, collects American art of the 20th and 21st centuries. And we talk a lot about interdisciplinarity um, that's inherent in 20th and 21st century uh, work art artworks and um you know I, I really loved uh sort of as a museum person as an educator as someone who works within a collection like that that uh you know the intersections between writing and visual arts and i you know the the writing was so visual and i mean i don't know if you know this but did uh the writer write that first and then Gregory Crutzen was inspired to make the photograph, or did Gregory Crutzen sort of describe and then the writer wrote yeah. it? Yeah, I mean, in that case, the writer, he refers to Kazi, who was his assistant at the time. And, and um, but, you know, she could write, and he would have these visions and these ideas, and he would discuss them, and she would craft them into these, you know, these, these treatments. And, and, and part of the point of that was then he could take that those treatments, you know, would capture his vision for the photograph, and then he could give them to his other collaborators. He give them to his cinematographer and to all the people he was working with. So that was one way he communicated his vision to all the people on his team was through those write-ups. Yeah. So you yourself had some 
I think, collaborators on this film as well. I know that you did a lot of the cinematography yourself, but in terms of sort of creating this picture of something, the score for this film is really evocative and, and works so well with sort of the mood of the photographs and the process. And so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about um, how sort of the score and soundtrack was conceived to, to go with everything. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I can. Um, um, I mean, interestingly, the score was um, uh, originally, it was, um, uh, I, I, I originally, I mean, when you edit a movie like this, originally what you do is you, you know, rough out um, the score um, kind of with, you know, scratch music. Um, and you know, I wasn't really sure, you know, what it was gonna be like, what the score was gonna be like at first. Um, but that's just kind of the, the um, you know, how the, how the process works typically. Um, and uh, so I kind of did that and I, you know, um, approached a guy named Dana Kaparov who wrote the score for it and, and, and the movie and showed him this kind of scratch music that the editor and I had put in. Um, and I knew it wanted to, needed to capture a certain mood. I mean, the music in this film, um, uh, it, it very it guides you through this, this, the, the, the film in a lot of ways. And it creates a real strong sense of mood. And one thing I wanted to do a little bit was, I mean, with the, with the soundtrack, um, you know, I wanted it to be a little bit, um, uh, a little bit, not not surreal, but have a little little bit of hint of melodrama into in it. Um, kind of evoke some of the sense of strangeness that was in Gregory's work um, to be a little stylized. And so that's that's one of the things we were kind of going for with with the music. I agree. The music to me was just so spot on um, throughout the film um, to create the mood, but it also I think really evoked a, a sense of mystery that. Um, I think is very inherent to Crudson's photos and that he acknowledges, um, you know, Hillary talked about has, how his father um, was uh, a psychoanalyst and that he always felt that there was a sense of mystery from what was going on in his basement. It was like a place of secrets that you didn't mm -hmm. talk about and um, that that sort of infuses his work. So yeah, I just, I love the score. So I'm glad that you yeah. asked about that, Hillary. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a helpful, it's helpful device always in filmmaking, but especially I think of this film. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, here's another clip uh, about uh, shooting uh, the film, uh, sorry, the photograph called the Madison. And that's that really dramatic one with the sky. He said, this is the best sky we've ever had. So um, Ben, while I'm getting that ready, can you set that one up for us? Yeah, it's an exterior shot and um, it, it's outside. The Madison is actually a, a bar. This is like many of his places, his photographs that are shot in certain towns in the Berkshires, Western Mass. And this one's in, in Pittsfield, which is a very, I mean, a lot of it's kind of very kind of depressed um, town. And there is actually this bar there. And um, the woman in the photograph um, is, like most of the people in his photographs, as, as you mentioned, are people that they found in and around there. We're ready. Just get lost in your own mood, OK? Just get lost, OK? That's perfect. Just try that. All the photographs made on location are made in twilight. Mostly because that's when we could use the lights. That's nice. I like that. You couldn't really work with these lights in the middle of the day. And at night, it'd be just way too contrasty. So there's a very small period of time where it all comes together. Oh, yeah. Okay, shoot in. Okay, position and hold. Beautiful, let's do it again. I prefer not to be behind the camera because I want the most direct experience with the subject as possible. Great. Colleen could just look a slightly bit more towards camera. My 
pictures are about a search for a moment, a perfect moment in a way. To me, the most powerful moment in the whole process is when everything comes together and there is that perfect, beautiful, still moment. Look at that sky. That's the best sky we've ever had. And for that instance, my life makes sense. Here we go, man. I think this is it. Okay, last exposure for Colleen. Position and hold. Gorgeous. I just get chills watching that. So do you have any further commentary on that particular um, scene? Um, let me think. I mean, you know, the point of the point of that moment is just this idea of twilight, right? I mean, all his photographs are, you know, he, he did have this idea that, um, I mean, they're all basically shot during, you know, what is referred to as magic hour, right? There's this little period before sunset when the light's a certain way. And 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 the way all the shoots would work is they would, um, you know, they'd spend the day setting up and wait for this little chunk of time right before and after sunset. And then they'd shoot a bunch of pictures and then they were done. It's like it would get too dark and they would be done. And so all of them were made during that little frame of time. So that's kind of, in a way, that's kind of what the point of that that picture is really in terms of the narrative of, of how his process works. Do you want to ask the next question, Hillary? Or you want me to? Um, I think the next question was one of mine. I so. think so, yeah. Um, so, you know, that clip really highlights how it's like this very specific moment, right? And um, Crewson speaks a couple times about how the moment in which the picture sort of exists is the only one that really matters to him. And I know that when we look at photographs, particularly works that seem strong in narrative, we think what comes before and what comes after. And he does not care about that at all. Uh, so I'm wondering that as a, as a filmmaker who's very concerned with telling a story, are there ever instances where you find yourself agreeing with the fact that there is a singular moment that maybe matters more than what comes before or after? Um, well, I mean, uh, I mean, you know, yeah, film, film is a very different medium, obviously, because there's time right? It takes place over time. <laughs> and so, and so when you're in, I mean, even that's an example. It's like, you know, like on that day when he was, he was shooting, I mean, I was filming all day, right? And, and in the movie, you see stuff that happens all day, but then it does arrive at this kind of moment and kind of focus in on this one moment where he's making the, making the picture. And so in that sense, you know, in filmmaking, there is a before and after, and there is a kind of a moment that's kind of, you know, a pivotal moment. I mean, what that moment is may be, be changing, but you know, it, it, it's, it's definitely part of making films. It's, it's, you know, because it's not abstracted from time that way. I do really love the um, sort of conceit that you use throughout the film though, where there's sort of a slow zoom and focus on different parts of the photograph. Mm -hmm. um, because even though we're, you know, you're using time to, to, hone in on particular elements of the film, I, I feel like, you know, you're still giving us that moment to really appreciate what the medium of film can do for these photographs specifically and to allow us to sort of suspend um, throughout this, this larger narrative that you're building about his process and the making of these works that we still get to sort of experience those through your, your filmmaking yeah. techniques. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, that's, that's kind of, I mean, you know, if there's stories, I mean, as you were saying before, it's, we were saying before is like you know, every, it's, it's a risk every time you do it, it's a, it's an act of faith to make something. And for, for him, that's very true. It's like each, each of the episodes in the movie where he's making his photographs, it's like the, the the question is always will it will it will he pull it off, right? 
And so that question is answered. I mean, I was hoping in the movie that question is answered when you see the final images, right? And so, you know, that that's when you find out if he if 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 all his effort succeeded, you know. Um, and so the, the question was then, as in, in a movie, how do you display those photographs? I mean, I'd really encourage everyone to come look at the photographs in person because they're very striking as objects. I mean, you have some of the a couple of the big ones, right? In your exhibition, yeah. I mean, they're like, you know, they're they're several feet across, and so they, you know, when you see them on, you know, online or on this screen, you know, you know, they kind of look like. But when you see them in person, they have this whole other kind of quality, just because of the scale of the physical objects of the photographs, and 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 so by scanning over the photographs as I did in the movie. I hope to kind of give a little, evoke a little bit of the quality you get when you see them up close of kind of looking here and looking there. You know, the, the act of observing the photographs in person, you, you do, you focus on different parts and you, you know, and you, when you watch people see the photograph, watch, because I watch people in galleries. I film people in galleries, it's in the movie. I film people looking at the photographs and, and, and they do, they kind of go up close and they look at this part and they move over and look at that part. You know, there are all these different elements that you can kind of explore. And, and so I wanted to have the film image explore those elements of the photographs that same way, which is why it kind of scans around them that way. Yeah, I think last week or the week before we used uh, the photograph that we have in the exhibition on one of our uh, Friday afternoon discussion programs. And we spent about 20 minutes looking at it and talking about it, but we easily could have spent an entire hour like it was hard to get people to sort of stop looking at it because you know he uses these I think it's an eight by ten uh um, film the medium camera. format yeah at the, yeah. At the time and, now he's and so it captures this gorgeous like super level of detail that makes it it makes sort of every part of the photograph important by making by giving everything sort of um this beautiful sharp focus and so you have to use your brain as well as your eye to sort of make sense and and tell the story yeah, the, I mean, there. Yeah, there's like no. I mean, then he was using film. Now he's switched to using digital. But there, but there's no, there's no grain. There's no. You, know, you can. They were kind of amazing as objects, right? Especially if you're interested in photographs, because you you get up like this close, and there's like no. There's like they're still sharp. Right. You know? I would describe. I mean, at least the one that we have. I've seen um, some of his other works as well in person, and. They are, particularly the ones that he's using, the static light, um, they're luminous in and of themselves. Like the actual objects feel luminous, which is quite, I think, a feat to, to capture that in a photograph. Absolutely. I want to get back to something that you had mentioned sort of towards the beginning of the program when you were talking about your experience of making the film. Um, usually a documentary, documentary photographer or filmmaker sort of removes themselves from their subject matter in order to avoid influencing the story or uh, any natural outcomes of the story. Um, but as you said that over the multi-year film shoot, the, the crew sort of gradually incorporated you more and more into the work of Crudson's image making. Um, do you feel that you were able to preserve a sense of artistic distance with Crudson and his crew in a way that felt authentic to you and the story you were trying to tell? Um, yeah, I'm not sure I believe in artistic distance in that way. I mean, you know, because it's, 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 I'm a person and I'm, I'm making, I'm a filmmaker and I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm making a story that is, I'm a, make, I'm a storyteller. And, you know, I'm not, I mean, this idea that I'm like translating reality somehow, it's like, well, that's just isn't how it works. Cause you, you know, it's like every choice you make as a filmmaker is, is, is you're telling a story. And I'm, so it's, it, in a way, this is, I mean, every, every documentary is someone's story about something that's in the world. <laughs> so, so from that standpoint, you know, but, but also, um, uh, I'm thinking about particularly, I mean, there are some experiences I had where, you know, a lot of times I would be, because I was kind of hanging out with and filming Gregory a lot. And so a lot of times it would just be, we'd be the two of us would be on the set and we would talk about stuff and you just kind of, and I feel like 
I'm, I guess I'm comfortable with that approach to filmmaking. It would be odd in those moments after having hang, been around for years to be hanging out with him on the set and to like, like he's, he's not gonna, he's gonna pretend I'm not there for like years at a time. And I'm gonna like, so you, you know, we, we get to know each other and we were, you know, we would chat and he would ask me things and I, or I'd ask him things about what was going on. And that, that's also useful for me as a filmmaker because then he gets kind of comfortable. You want people, you, you, I wanted him to be comfortable having me around and to talk even. Because there were times, there are times in the movie where we'd be, he'd be doing something on set, and I'd want to ask him something. I'd say, "Well, what, what, are you, why are you doing that? What is that?" And so he would just turn and talk to me. And so you know, it, it, yeah, it gets a little fuzzy, I guess. It, but you know, I was always there. I'm always there. I mean, in those situations, I'm always there, aware that I'm also a journalist. You know, but journalists go like when journalists, when print journalists go somewhere, they don't not speak to people. They're not unfriendly. You know, you engage with people and, 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 you know, probably so they can relax and probably just being human. And so it's very much the same process with me. I will say one thing about that, about that. I don't know, I don't know. It's, it's in the movie. There's this, and I, the photograph, I guess, is in your ex, exhibition. But the last picture in the movie they take is of a man standing under a movie marquee. And, and when I was, when we were, when they were, and I was filming them trying to cast that and they hadn't cast it yet. And they asked me to be that person. They asked, this crew said, do you want oh, to- Oh, was that me? you? No, it wasn't me. Oh, okay. <laughs> they, they asked if it would be me. And I said, no, because I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to film it. But so, you know, so in that sense, I mean, I was, you know, I was around enough. That was exciting have... for a second. <laughs> well, I did yeah. have a moment where I was like, Wonder if they would have asked Ben to do. This. I don't yeah. know why. Like it actually popped yeah. into my mind that like. Well, it kind of yeah. I guess they look him somewhat you know tall. It looked a certain way. <laughs> so yeah, I thought about it. I mean, it would have been, been fun to have now, but I you know I don't regret the decision. Oh it yeah, great, it's a great scene. <laughs> it's a great scene, and it's a great sort of you know culmination of everything yeah. that happens. Yeah, 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 it's, yeah. 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 it's I, I was very like I don't know. I, I felt a lot of anticipation throughout that very last. Um, photograph mm -hmm. making mm -hmm. process. So um, yeah, it was certainly one of the most challenging. Um, I mean, one of the, you know, he shoots some in winter. One of the things about winter is that that magic hour, the window of light is, is really short. And so, you know, in addition to the challenges of doing stuff in that, and like that, that day it was like cold. Like I remember shooting outside and then people were like rushing into this bank vestibule where like the, where the cash machines were to like warm up because it was so cold outside. Um, so a kind of question to you about your process and some technical things here. Um, throughout the films, it seems like you use different types of cameras and lenses, um, some of which really fostered a keener sense of immediacy with Crudson and others, um, and, and other moments that really felt more cinematic in terms of the actual camera technique that you were using or camera that you were using. Was this conscious or a choice sort of foreign out of circumstance? Well, yes, more so. I mean, I basically, to be honest, you know, most of it was shot with one camera. With one kind of camera, but it was a camera that has a built-in long zoom lens. So there was so there was the focal length varies quite a bit. Um, and I, when I shot it, I did at one point I kind of invented this rule for myself, both kind of for stylistic reasons and also just because of of um, and this is probably more what you're thinking about for practical reasons. Um, because when, I, when they were doing all the prep work, I could be anywhere. I mean, Gregory basically gave him carte blanche to be anywhere, anytime while they were setting things up. And I, so I could roam around the set and get all these shots and do whatever. But then when they were shooting, of course, I couldn't be close. I could be close to him, but I couldn't be close to anything else because you can't be in, in the shot, right? And so the, the, the shots that, that I, the, the shots in the movie um, when they're filming, the actual photographs are all much longer or long lens. They're all telephoto. And the stuff in all the preparation is mostly all kind of wide angle closer up. And also the stuff in the the stuff when they're shooting the pictures, when they would start to shoot the pictures, I also would go on a tripod. And and while they're setting up, it was all handheld. And so I kind of knew, I kind of wanted there to be that difference also. That that when he was shooting, everything would get kind of still and more formal. And kind of calmer and and no camera movement and and so that was 
that was kind of a deliberate, it was a practical choice and also kind of a deliberate stylistic choice. Yeah, you sort of um, captured the energy of leading up to the perfect moment, mm -hmm. right? Where it got still. Um, so to get back to, um, you were talking earlier about your storytelling style and the choices that you made in, in telling the story. Um, you didn't tell the story in a purely linear fashion. You, you interwove um, Gregory Crudson's family history and his evolution as a photographer with the progression of this pivotal series um, within his body of work. Why did you choose to flash back and flash forward um, in your storytelling technique rather than sort of approaching it just chronologically and linearly, if that's a word, linearly? Yeah, no. <laughs> um, well, I guess, well, you know, for me, this kind of stuff comes down to like these very practical storytelling considerations, which was, I felt like having the um, scenes of him making photographs be back to back to back that there might, you might kind of feel it, 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 it might lose, they might lose impact if you just saw them one after another. So I kind of felt like I wanted them to be divided up by something and, and, con and conversely, you know, all the life story stuff, you know, if that had been all put in one lump at the beginning of the movie, so it told that stuff chronologically, I also felt like, you know, it was just more conventional and kind of less interesting. I felt like the meat of the movie is the process, but that the process stuff couldn't all be in one stretch. So that just suggested a way of kind of interspersing them. And so it was, it was really, it was really that. It was, it was kind of, it was a problem solving thing. And it's funny when I think about that as a, as an issue, um, I think about a com particular conversation I had with a friend, my friend Penelope Falk, who's a very well-regarded documentary film editor. And I, and, and she actually kind of like, it was in that conversation, it was one particular conversation I remember that that, that idea came up and then I, that, that took it in that direction. It worked really well. I'm not criticizing. I was just wondering sort of, yeah. it, you know, yeah how you came to that to that was, choice yeah it's it's like all other stuff it's it's you know problem solving really it's like how do you how do you find a solution to this so i think we've got sort of one more question here and then we've got a few questions from the chat box that we want to get to as well um, at the end of the film Crutzen said that he believes that every artist has one story to tell a story that defines who they are as an artist as an artist and filmmaker yourself, what do you think is your story to tell? Yeah, that's yeah, that's hard. Um, well, I will say this: I'm always interested in people. I'm, I'm, I, a lot of my work has been about um, uh, people doing creative work um, and attempting creative work in one way or another, and and that process, and also kind of the. Uh, the larger significance of that process as a way of, you know, making sense of the world, um, as a way of kind of understanding, you know, what it is to be human, you know, that fundamental question of like who we are. Um, I, I see creative work as a lens through which to, to approach those questions. Um, so, and that and that's and that's something that is and that's clear in this film, right? I mean, you know, and, and I think and I think it kind of is something that it occurs to me um, and and is I mean I've done a lot of things that both in you know in kind of radio work and also my film and TV stuff. So it's been a lot about that, about kind of, you know, um, what creative work does in the world. Um, you know, how it's and also as an act of of defining, um, you know, what we think. I think people do make make things in a sense to to kind of def, to, to position themselves in the world, even politically and culturally. Um, you know, I, I think it has a real kind of um, you know art and creativity. You know, is an essential part of functioning as a human, as a society, and so in that sense, it's it's of interest to me. So I guess if I were thinking of that, that you know, that's kind of been a recurring interest always. Um, and I could talk about my personal life and all that stuff and how that how that came to be, but we it's maybe more than we need to go into here. 
we have a couple of questions from the chat box so that I will uh, start asking you those. So these are coming in from our audience today, Ben. Um, would you talk about the ways that Crudson's final photos are like or unlike a film still? Um, yeah, well, I mean, they're very like a film still in their way that they're produced, right? In the way that I said, I mean, he, you know, the people, the crews he work with, the, the, the apparatus that he uses to make these images, both in terms of the actual machinery and the equipment involved, and in terms of the crew, how the crew is organized. I mean, that's something that you don't really see in the movie exactly, but like, if you're someone who's ever been, you know, behind the scenes on a film, uh, on a kind of feature film on location, where there's like a production office and a team of like a staff of production people and there's catering and there's like, you know, there's a craft services. There's all this stuff that, you know, is like a movie. And so in that way, it, it is, you know, very cinematic. Um, but I would also say there's also this funny thing about it too, which is when, when people are shooting movies, they don't spend days on one shot generally, right? They're, they're kind of going through them and at, at they're other end of this tremendous time pressure. And so in a certain way, his images, they're, they're cinematic in, in, in technique, but they're more, they're like, they're more refined, they're more careful, they're more particular, you know? Yeah, I think he talked about being a perfectionist and sort of yeah. driving everyone crazy up until the moment at which point, you know, you have your, your minute or your 20 minutes when you can shoot and then everybody's like, Okay, but it makes sense. <laughs> you know, we've spent yeah. all day getting ready for this, yeah, and film, now it's beautiful and perfect. Perfect. So we'll give you a pass. Film directors don't don't work like that. They can't work like that. They've got too much to do. They're doing like hundreds of shots mm -hmm. instead of just one. You know, he does like if he works for a week, he does seven shots, one a day. You can never make a film like that. You know? <laughs> so they're very influenced, and also it's you know, and he's also very influenced as as you mentioned, you know, by cinema. So they 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 clearly evoke cinema that in that way they're kind of like reinterpretations of the language of cinema in some way i mean it's hard to imagine these photo his photographs existing outside of movies and movie history so thanks judy for that question um kathy's question is really interesting as uh, she noted that uh Gregory Crudson is one artist working on that set and you're another artist working on that set. Um, and you're both making, you know, two different creations concurrently. Um, she wanted to know uh, how complex uh, was the process of having two crews, your crew and his crew uh, interacting um, and, and sort of dancing uh, together to make your yeah. respective art. That's a good question. I mean, well, as I said, you know, one thing is, you know, my crew was just me, right? Um, and so the, that fundamentally changes things. I mean, I work that way when I can, and I've kind of developed a way of doing that. So, and, and so, the, you know, the, 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 so the job was for just me to kind of, I mean, he did, he had this agreement up front, right? From the beginning, he said, you can go anywhere and film anything, which was like, great. That's like, the ultimate for a documentary filmmaker in the situation. And he told his crew that. So I could film, I could, I could do anything. The one rule was, which I knew, was that I couldn't, I couldn't interfere with their work. And I couldn't, you know, I couldn't get in the shot. You know? And so, you know, there were times when I basically I could just kind of roam around and do anything until the moment when they took the pictures. And then I had to back off to some extent. And so that that's kind of really what the extent of the choreographer. It was it's like it was so big and there's so much going on that you know I would go off and film something over here. I'd film the cinematographer working over there. I'd film some guys moving a car, you know. And 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 Gregory wouldn't even know I was there for a lot of time because I was off doing different things. So that's kind of how how it worked. I mean, there there were a couple of that actually that one that shot hatch. I actually was on the because you couldn't see most of that backyard because there was, you could only see the part from his point of view, from the camera, from his, the point of view of Gregory's camera, you could only see out this door. And so I was actually shooting on this, I was on the set, but just out of view. So he was super generous and I was just careful. Basically how that worked. <laughs> 
Well, it makes it easier that you didn't come with your own large crew. Your crew was you. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. makes you very that, nimble. You know, that's very, yeah, yeah. And it, also, it makes it nimble. And also, I always feel like, you know, because I've been doing this for that kind of way for a long time. And I always feel like, you know, when you're when you're with even like a couple of their people, your crew, and when it's just when it's just one person, it's like, oh, there's Ben with his camera. And and so the whole the whole relationship to the, the situation is different. Great. Uh, we have one more question from the chat box from Ruben, um, and it's a really good question um, because you not only captured uh, Crudson making the work and Crudson's crew um, assisting him to make the work, but you also would turn the camera on the spectators, um, the folks that were here living in these um, neighborhoods or walking on these streets and sort of bearing witness to the uh, action that was taking place to, to set up these shots. And most of the turning that camera uh, on the spectators showed sort of a fascination with the process, but there was a really interesting scene uh, at the end when it was snowing and there was a gentleman who was trying to uh, shovel uh, the sidewalk in front of his store because he was very concerned about people walking by and slipping and who who would be responsible for that. So I'm wondering, you know, were there other moments, you know, over the course of this uh, decade long shoot where um, you experienced any pushback or reservation from the towns or the residents um, towards what Crudson was doing? You know, was his vision welcomed or did it take a little persuasion to be able to work in the situations and environments in which the photos were made? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think the answer to that is that he's been doing it for so long that at one point he had to convince people that this was like a good thing and 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 it was not, you know, you know, at one point he came on and he'd block off these streets and then people were like, what are you doing? You've got to drive around town and it's a big nuisance. But he's been doing it for so long. I mean, he's been doing this for like more than 20 years in these same towns. And, and so people know who he is. And so it's like, oh, that photography guy, he's doing his thing again. And he's kind of just, you know, it's something that just happens. And so I think people, people have, by and large, are fine with it. Um, I think um, they, you know, they find it interesting. I think they appreciate the attention that he, has, you know, he, he, he himself pays to those, those spaces that they occupy, you know. Um, so there's not, that was, it was rare that I, I saw that happen um, at, at this point. But like I said, I mean, and I remember him saying that at one point he did have to kind of convince people initially, but just, you know, it's like the guy, he's like, he's the guy in town who does that thing basically at this point. I mean, you, you know, he literally, it's like, like Pittsfield, Massachusetts and Lee and North Adams, you know, there's, there are these like a few towns and that he's been going back over and over and over and for like, you know, it's been now, it's been like, you know, over 20 years. Well, we've talked a lot about this amazing film that you've made and Christy gave us a little bit of some of your other projects there at the beginning of this evening. What's next for you? What's your next big project and adventure? Uh, yeah, well, um, I mean, the, the, the big project now is I mean, I do this radio work and I work with the radio diaries and that's kind of ongoing. And um, um, just today we were working on a, s a script about um, a, 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 a former military coup in what was then Burma. Um, so that, that kind of work is ongoing. But in my other big film project now is this film about Max Roach, um, drummer, composer, activist. And um, it's going to be, we're finishing up this year. So... Um, that's going to be around early next year, I think. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the big, and I have my, you know, kind of feelers out for the next film, um, beyond that. But, but at this point, that's kind of the big occupying thing is getting that, the Max Roach film, um, uh, uh, done. And, and we're very excited about it. I'm, I'm co-directing it with, uh, Sam Pollard. Who's a, a well-known director, and, and we've been working on it for a number of years. So it's another. I tend to do these long-term projects, and that's it's another one of those. Well, we'll certainly keep our eye out for that one. Um, thank you so much for the great conversation and sharing your work with us tonight, Ben. I'd like to thank you for working with us to put together this evening's program, um, and 
it's been a lot of fun and we are so grateful for your time um, at this point uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really glad we could uh, yeah really thanks thanks for letting me do it and i really enjoyed it it was a lot of fun yeah. no well we appreciate the insight it's been it's been really wonderful and again if you haven't watched the film you really should give yourself the treat of doing so. It's it's wonderful. Um, so at this point, I'm going to ask Chrissy to give us some parting information. <laughs> Sorry, was I muted? Uh, thank you, Hillary, Ben, and all of you for joining us tonight virtually. If you haven't already seen Ben's film, as Hillary said, please do head over to the film's website, gregorycrudsonmovie.com for streaming options. Uh, or if you want to appreciate all the fine detail of the film on the big screen, the Grail Movie House in the River Arts District is now available for private rentals. Bring your COVID pod or just your significant other for a screening of Gregory Crudson Brief Encounters. Visit grailmoviehouse.com for more information and to see how our friends at the Grail are working to keep patrons and staff safe during this time. We'll be sending out an evaluation to collect your feedback on this evening's program, so please watch your email. If you haven't already seen the exhibition and this beautiful photograph in the exhibition, the museum is currently open to visitors. We're operating at reduced capacity and have a number of COVID-19 safety measures in place. You can learn more about those safety measure measures as well as our current and upcoming exhibitions, virtual programs, and small group and person offerings at ashevilleart.org. And if you enjoyed tonight's program, please consider making a donation to our annual fund or becoming a museum member. Please also mark your calendars for our upcoming In Conversation programs. This spring, the curators of two of our special exhibitions will join us. On March the 25th, Scott Schweigert from the Reading Public Museum will discuss Across the Atlantic, American Impressionism Through the French Lens, now on view uh, here at the museum through April 19th, I think. And on April the 22nd, Stephen Wicks from the Knoxville Museum of Art will discuss Beaufort Delaney's Metamorphosis into Freedom. These programs are posted on our website. For more information and to register, visit ashevilleart.org. Many thanks to Art Bridges for its generous sponsorship of tonight's program and all of the In Conversation virtual art talks we have on the horizon. We hope to see you in the galleries or at another virtual program through our Museum From Home initiative soon. Thank you for all your support. Stay well and have a great rest of your week.